Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth? Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and the team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you are looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. We are back with another episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing, climbing closer to episode number 100. And as we do that, you're probably used to hearing this a lot. But if you follow the podcast, it really helps us grow. And always the best thing to do is just share it with a friend who you think might be interested in the episode that you listen to. Just one person. You never know what effect it could have on them. I would appreciate it. And podcasts are a great way to disseminate information about real estate investing that people can listen to like you. Maybe you're at the gym. You know, Maybe you're driving your car, taking a walk. I support it all, and thank you. This week, we have Travis King, and this is another land-flipping show. He is going to talk to you about unleashing your inner entrepreneur through land-flipping. Let's do this. This is episode 96 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Travis King. Travis is a husband, dad, entrepreneur who has gotten into the world of land flipping. He's personally completed with his wife, Becca, hundreds of land flips and now operates a coaching and educational service business for other people who want to get into land investing. He's done over a thousand one-on-one coaching calls. I'm excited to talk to him. Travis, welcome to the show. Hey, Jonathan, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yes, um, I'll get ready to talk to a land fanatic and a land yeah. evangelist. So, yeah, but I think that's a good thing. And we're going to talk about how you got to like your asset class that you like. But before we get there, because I know we we're just talking the pre call, when was the first time where you were involved in real estate in, in any way? Yeah, well, the, the funny thing, so the ironic thing, I guess, growing up is my dad subdivided land kind of on the side, right? So my dad actually owned rock quarries. So I, I grew up mm. working in rock quarries. All right. So I know work. I know what real work yeah. looks like. Yeah. Right. But uh he actually subdivided, yeah, bought and subdivided land growing up. So that was like how I was introduced, but it wasn't something you know, like anybody, you don't want to do what your parents do, right? Yeah. So I my I did J V with my dad on a deal. I mean, this is 19 years old. 1999, I JV'd on a subdivide deal with my dad, yeah. a land deal, and did really well. But then I decided, you know, I kind of wanted to go the house route. So I, I spent, you know, 2000 to 2008, which will sound, you know, 2008 should strike a, you know, yeah. there's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a red light there. Somebody, but, but yeah, yeah, chasing chasing houses, and, and then after crashing and, and burning, kind of uh, spent a couple of years regrouping, and then kind of found land and land flipping as a business model back in 2013. Oh, okay. And when you were chasing houses, what was that? Was that flipping? Because I know you were a contractor during that time as well. Yeah. No, it, at that time, it was just the, the plan was just buy and hold rentals. You know, yeah. it, it was very, the the problem was just being, I think, young and naive uh, to the extent of my education. Jonathan was, was honestly like, if I'm, I'm being like, just candid, it was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then going out there and, and, and getting, you know, kind of using yeah. it as a motivation, but not really studying the book because because mm. the, the content's there, the knowledge is there, but it was more, for me, it was more just like jumping in young and naive. Right. Yeah. But, but the approach was the idea was just to buy a rental house every two years, you know, and kind of use the W-2s. And thankfully, I guess now in hindsight, right, with the, the whole market crashing in the 08 recession, it had me rethink the whole strategy, which, you know, every two years buying a rental, the, the problem with that is you're stuck at your W-2, you know, yeah, needing those pay stubs. So it was probably a good thing for me in hindsight. And I say that with a lot of distance from now. And in the 08 bubble. Yeah. But yeah, that kind of allowed me to kind of rethink what asset class and my approach. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, you, you always saw real estate, it seems as like a potential asset class and at least supplementary income. What was the turning point to know like, okay, I really want to get out of the nine to five and I think I can do this full time. Did that come during the land flipping time when you Gosh, figured out land was the asset? That's always kind of felt like an inner conflict. You know, I was only a couple of years into my corporate career when the outfit I worked for got bought by an investment company. And then they started to lay people off yeah. and clean things up and then resold the company, you know, and, and it kind of at an early age, it one, it kind of took the wind out of my sails, but two, it also like exposed me to, you know, like how quickly things can change, you know, really good jobs with really good salaries can go away, you know, just like that. So for me, I think that was, uh, again, <laughs> with a lot of years behind me, that's, yeah. that was a, it was a good thing that happened as a blessing at the time, because it made me realize like, Hey, you you kind of have to build your own empire and your own income stream outside of an employer, right? And, yeah. and as I started to research that, you know, self-made, I guess, self-made wealth, self-made millionaires, yeah. you know, I kept hearing nine out of 10 millionaires got there from real estate. And then as I dug into it, I was like, okay, maybe it's only actually seven out of 10. But at the same time, <laughs> the common denominator was like real estate investing. Yeah. yeah. And so I, you know, so I decided essentially that was going to be my avenue, right? And then it just became within that kind of, you know, umbrella of real estate, like what asset class are there the least barriers to entry or, you know, like kind of what is a good opportunity for me with my age and my resources and, yeah. means and everything. And that's kind of what led me to land. Yeah, I think barriers to entry is a great term for land specifically because you you can get it for not a lot of money. Yeah. You still need to know what you're doing to be able to trade it, but like as far as asset classes go, there's there's not many with a lower barrier to entry money-wise than land. Yeah, that was ours. Like our first one we bought off of and for those not familiar bid for assets.com. It's the number four in the middle. You might be familiar with it, Jonathan, but oh, okay, bid for yeah. assets.com online auction site. We, we bought like a $500 lot, you know, an auction tax delinquent lot, and then, <laughs> you know, turn around and sold it for a little over 2000, I think. Right. So it was like, it's not big change your life money, but at the same time, there was 10 or less hours in it. And it yeah. made me like realize like, Hey, that, yeah, the worst that could go wrong is I lose 500 bucks. So when I say like barriers to entry, it really is low if if you're not going after big deals, you know, you just want proof of concept um, lands a yeah. really good starting point for, for some investors. Yeah. I mean, there's two great points in there. One, I mean, the scale on that is good though. That's a four X return. So the way that I would think about it, and maybe you did at the time, you're like, okay, this is a small scale, 500 to 2000, but like, maybe what if that applies at a hundred thousand? <laughs> That sounds nice. Is that something that you guys thought? Like, okay, 4X is, sounds pretty good. We did one and it was like that. It was like buy for 586. I don't remember the numbers. It was sell for 2400 or something around there, you know? Yeah. And then the next one, it was like, we bought it for the same price, identical lot, sold for like 5400 right? So it was like all of a sudden, okay, you know, although that's still, again, not a ton of money, like for, you know, that was like a net, that was probably like a month's wages or something at the yeah. time. So yeah, my brain got going. And the first question was like, all right, like, now that I know this works, it was like, how many times, how can I exploit this? How many of these yeah. deals can I do? And how many can I do per year? Right? Like how much can I make per deal? And how many can I do per year it was instantly you jump from, you know, doing, you know, when you've never done a deal, there's this like Grand Canyon gap between like a wannabe real estate investor yeah, yeah. and actually your first deal. But then once you get through a deal, the next thing is like, you go, okay, like, right, how do I do my next hundred of these? Right. So yeah. for us, yeah, like you said, it, it got the wheels spinning of like, how many can I do? And the answer was like, we did like 72 or 73 deals, I think, our second year. Wow. You know, awesome. And again, very small, but stacked up and incredibly low risk, right? Like laying out 500 to a thousand dollars really allowed us to kind of, you know, enter into the asset class of land without, you know, betting the farm or, or putting up all of our savings. Yeah, I think it's really great because if you start with 500 and then you, you know, you get to that second one where you, you turn that 500 into 5,000 and you're at a 10x, you're really playing with house money for a little bit. So you can say like, wait, we can buy 10 of the same thing that we just bought. And what if they all send, sell 10x? Like yeah. not all of them are going to, but like 
that's a very good educated risk, like you said, with low barrier to entry. But also another thing that's important that you said that I've talked about with other investors that you were willing to lose the 500 for the educational. Like if it, if it didn't pan out, it was an amount that you would be okay with. And that amount's different for all investors. But that was, is that something that made it like more safe to you? Like, hey, we're going to try this. Doesn't work. Okay. It is. And for me, there was a little bit, and I say this still without respect, people who've served, they might not like me using this term, but I almost had PTSD from the house investing world with the craft, yeah, yeah. you know, where it was a little bit of just like hesitancy to, to go back in. So when I went back in is like, after five years of licking my wounds and just working yeah. at W2 and regrouping, I was, I was like, I wanted, you know, I wanted to be really cautious, really careful. Like, you know, I didn't yeah. want to lay out a bunch of money. So for me, I started really small. Like you're saying, we're going, Hey, worst case scenario, lose 500 or a thousand, but it's not 50,000 or a hundred thousand right. or yeah. like buying the rentals. Like we were doing, it's not 20% down. You know what I mean? I wasn't coming up with a bunch of money and yeah. there was really low risk. So that allowed me to like validate it, give me proof of concept and then do it at scale, which then allowed me, like you said, I used a great term, like house money, right? So all of a sudden I'm kind of playing with house money and house money versus like joint bank account with spouse yeah. is different, right? There's yeah. a different feel yeah. if I lose this money on, on a real estate deal. So yeah, you're exactly right. That's kind of what we did. Then we felt like we were playing with house money and we yeah. could start to, now that we are oriented on due diligence and valuing properties and kind of how this all worked, we felt comfortable adding a zero, right? And starting to go after a little bit bigger yeah. deal and graduate upward. Yeah. And I think one thing that maybe this was your journey too, that you find out with land, then the better you get at the due diligence and like what you do in between buying it and then putting it back on the market can drastically increase your profit base. And people don't understand that because they just think, well, it's just a piece of raw land. Like, okay, well, what if you do a perk test and then it's like ready to build right away? The, are these things that you, you, these are the things that as you went along, you're like, Ooh, now we can make more money. It takes a little bit more to do, but then the scale's even higher. Yeah. The, the first problem we had, the challenge we had was like, once we realized we got good at kind of like the acquisitions part of this, because yeah, we, yeah. we no longer used auctions. We were now using, you know, uh, data sources and then direct mail yeah. to target off market vacant land. It was kind of the, is what the strategy is off market vacant land with direct mail. But then the problem became capital, right? Like of, of, Hey, we can only, the challenge was we could, as we were doing these bigger deals, we would have to use our own money. We'd buy a deal and we'd need to wait for the deal to sell before yeah, we could yeah. bring that money back in. And, and you know how limiting that is, but in a young real estate investor's journey, you know, you've kind of got to hit that ceiling or, or that governor before you understand that, Hey, this, Unless I come into the game with a whole war chest of money, this I can't scale this or grow this in, until I bring in some outside capital. So that was kind of something at like year three that we started to figure out to do bigger deals. We've got to bring in some additional money, you know, beyond yeah. our own. And then what you're like, you're saying value adding, right? Like adding value where early on with the cheap properties, we were very much like velocity focused, kind of like a house wholesaler is always like, yeah, hey, yeah, you know, yeah, quick, quick nickel, quick nickel. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then you start to realize you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Right, yeah. Jonathan? So yeah, yeah. for us, like you're saying with the improvement, it became like, well, um, maybe we just you know, spend $1,500 and have a landscaper go out there and mow the lot, clear the lot. Yeah. Maybe we hire a drone photographer and, and the pictures are better, right? And we, we get top dollar instead of taking a discounted price. So we, we started to do that. And then we even started to look at things like subdividing, like when we would have a large acreage property come in, yeah, we would recognize in the surroundings, there was, there's much smaller lots around and we saw an opportunity. And then we, we understood the economics of like splitting the parcel, not adding jogging trails or sidewalks or infrastructure, but I mean, right. just literally splitting the parcel we started to, to see how that essentially forced appreciation. Yeah. And I've put on roofs, I've painted houses, I've built right. decks, I've, I've like, I've built sweat equity. But when I was first like became aware of subdividing and just by splitting the parcel, we force appreciation to me, Jonathan, it was like alchemy. It was magic. Yeah. I was like, I've, I've used paint sprayers. I've been on the roof. I've worked. <laughs> I know work. Right. Like yeah. this was incredible. Like we forced more appreciation just by subdividing a vacant 
a raw vacant land parcel than I ever had with a, a house, right? A house remodel yeah. or a house. I mean, I, I like to think of the subdivision as like a cake. Like, you know, you have a one cake and it's not cut. And then you're like, well, I don't want to eat all this cake. This is a lot of cake. And then you cut it into 12 slices and then 12 people can eat cake, all different people, that subdivision, you know, that, and you can get, you can get people to buy 12 different pieces and at a, at a better price. Like that, that's it in a nutshell. That's exactly what I tell people. It's like, you can buy a pizza hole for 12 bucks <laughs> or they'll charge you, you know, three bucks a slice, <laughs> right? right? Carve right. it into exactly. eight slices and you can charge it for three bucks a slice. And, right. sell, and that's kind of what subdividing how we do it is. So like you said, early on, we, we said, how do we, rather than doing more transactions per year, how do we bring home more per transaction? Yeah. And that became either adding value or positioning, like you're saying, with those, you know, those improvements and printing up the property. So yeah. those were kind of like epiphanies along the journey, right? Yeah. One thing uh, very important to, to focus on, this is a low barrier to entry, but like you said, it's also a cash barrier. It's a cash entry. So you can't, you can't scale up as quick as people think if you, if you're starting with just a little bit of money, because you're not getting loans on $5,000 land properties. So you'd, like you said, you, as you scale up the price, you may have to leave it in. Of course you can trade them pretty quickly, but then also maybe you don't have the outlay to do this stuff. That's a really good point for people with land investing, you, you may not get as fast as you think, but if you, you know, if you get the snowball going, it, it can make a lot of money in, in the well, end. And the other thing is like you just like a house wholesaler assigns a property or wholesales a property, you can do the same thing with land. Yeah, you know, there's absolutely. no reason why you can't get it under contract and charge an assignment fee. If that's yeah. your, if your preferred method is to not buy outright, which right. obviously could take four to six months, right? To see the yeah. property resell. Absolutely. Land can be wholesaled or assigned. We do it all the time. Yeah. So that that's, it really just whatever fits your goals, right? Whatever you're trying to accomplish. Some people want to stay in the deal and maximize profit. Others, maybe you're a monster at cold calling and talking on the phone and getting things under contract. Maybe your preferred method is just to get these contracts signed and assign them to somebody like you or me, right? right? And you and I want to buy it and hold this thing or resell yeah. it for full retail. But yeah, the, the beauty of it is you, a lot of the same exit strategies with other assets can be implemented, you know, with land without all the all the due diligence or landmines because yeah, quite yeah. often vacant land you know generally free and clear vacant land has a, a lot less gotchas or, or due diligence than yeah you know, um, a commercial property or industrial or you know so on and so forth yeah i always think of, i always think of like testing and getting it kind of build ready but there's something else that you said that i think is great it, it, the the fact of turning land into a better product outward in terms of drone footage and like mowing it or clearing it you know getting some trees down just so people can see it better that can literally four to like 10x your money on land versus what else is sitting there i always think of this in the context of rental properties like people you know they get a rental property and then they put it up for rent and they just put one picture from their cell phone and i'm like well i mean that's just bad marketing and it really yeah. never i didn't think of it too much in land but i know from looking at land like i see oh. one picture if i what saw the, a drone picture it's so much easier for me to buy you say you see a one picture and it's got like the county Bushes. gis parcel <laughs> boundary <laughs> right, and it's, right. it's terrible quality it's like some yeah or so just like a picture pick. of like just trees and like overgrown shrubbage like that you basically yeah. saying you can't even walk the property because you can't get in and so, like we, then you mow it take drone footage like that's easy because people don't need to go on site for land like it's all right there that's, and that's really what's changed thing. There was kind of like some, and, and more so early on than now, you still have some old timers that might say, well, land doesn't move or land doesn't sell. But a lot of that stigma is kind of pre-internet residue, right? If you will, yeah. meaning as soon as things like Zillow came on, you know, even eBay, like Zillow, land.com, Realtor, Redfin, like as soon as these national platforms that are also mobile apps yeah. allowed people in any state or country to start searching land, it opened things up. Yeah. Prior to that, historically, I think land was much more local 
you know? So like people would struggle with, with the resale of it because it was just yeah. the local buyer pool. Right. You're like and putting it in the newspaper or something. Yes. Yeah. You're in the, the penny saver, you know? <laughs> right. Like pretty, pretty and then it was the Craigslist, place. which is like, you know, the land next to like someone selling a xylophone. So I, so you know. internet has changed, as you know, like, you know, internet has just increased that buyer pool or eyeballs and views on the properties, which yeah. is, unless you're just buying the land to capture equity, if the strategy is actually to resell and realize the gain or profit, then like you need to, re- you need dispositions, you need views, you need listings, you need to yeah. resell. So I feel like the, the internet, all the, these listing platforms, especially mobile friendly ones have really opened yeah. up things to where days on market is significantly reduced For and sure. kind of allows you to, to buy and sell, not just in your own backyard, but yeah. in, in more markets than, than you, then I feel like you probably previously could in the eighties or nineties. Yeah. But it also shows off how important that presentation is. I think of that in regard to short-term rentals, you know, you have two short-term rentals, one next to each other, one has terrible photos and like not great furniture. The other one is the exact same house with better photos and better furniture. That one's going to make like 10 X the one next to it. Same for land. Someone can have a piece sitting for 300 days, you know, just because there's that dumb photo that we talked about. And then, you know, like you put in a drone video, you just sell it every, every time. And that cost outlay is important to the money part that we said, because in the beginning, like a lot of people are going to start with low, but you build up to that. And then you see like, okay, well now if I take drone photos, I get a three X. So then, you know, next time, like I'm just going to immediately do it for all of them. Yeah. You need to write It's kind of like digital marketing world of like clickbait, right? Like you need somebody to click on that thumbnail or cover photo to even start to look at your listing. So if you can't get past that, Right. So that's the very first thing you've got to have. And you're right. Well, so when people like when we're teaching real estate investors how to land investors, how to choose agents, you know, those are some of the things we're looking for. We're looking at days on market with that agent. Are they a specialized land agent is really important to us because land is kind of a different animal. So we find that some agents are much stronger at valuing it and know the demand for it. Right. And they and know the buyers, the, you know, they have the buyers because it, yeah. it's not it's not like just Bob Smith who's like, hey, you know, I'm just thinking of a piece of land in Topeka, Kansas today. Like, that's not your buyer. Yeah. So you, you ha- choosing an agent is critical and kind of like, yeah, looking at their previous listing and days in market and, sure. and things like that allows you to choose a really good agent. What, but those other things you talked about are key, though, because. The things like a perk test, I, 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 the way I look at it, and it's more we stumbled on this, right? After like having some transactions, and then we kind of do the whole thing like you do after the game. You look at the game film and go, hey, what went right? <laughs> what went wrong? Yeah, and we go, missed a couple blocks. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's what? These ones that sold quickly, what did we do right? And then yeah. we started to notice, Jonathan, like you said, like, hey, we, we had a wetland survey, we had a perk test done. All of these things that would either create friction or just add time to the due diligence when we resold, we solved all these problems ahead of time. And guess what? The, the, the time from under contract to closing on the resale went way quicker. And then we, so like you're saying, we started to build in, Hey, all right, on any properties over a hundred thousand dollars, we do, we, we do a drone video, right? Yeah. 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 We do a wetlands, you know, um, report, we do a survey. We do a perk test if it's in a market that we need a perk test. Yeah, right. So some of these things, we solve all of those things. They're going to kind of become friction points or, or frequently asked questions. We solve for that on our acquisition side. We solve for that problem on the disposition or sales side. And yeah. it creates a much lower days on market. And as you know, like your agents love it. They appreciate that because the, these are the questions they're going to have to field. Yeah. So for us, we, we kind of build that in. And the, re, the truth of it is, Although it's an expense you incur, you know, on the front end, yeah. the reality is it, you end up getting closer to your list price or, sure. or you don't have to entertain as much of a discount yeah. on the sell side. If you've prettied up the property with by mowing it or clearing the lot, done drone footies versus just throwing that, like you said, that that ugly screenshot <laughs> as the cover photo, you, you might be accepting 20% less than list price, right? Yeah. I mean, I've seen uh, there's there's land, you know, there's lots near me that are like a million dollars on their own for the lot. And they like are iPhone photos. And I'm like, yeah, 
what are you doing? But I like him what you just said about really prepping it and making it easy for people. And what I've said to all sellers of residential real estate is we want them always to do a pre-inspection. And it's because we want them to know everything about the property so that we can present that to the buyers. And they always say, well, you know, I don't want to know if, if something's wrong. It's like, yeah. but they're going to do an inspection and find out anyway. And then your days on market are going to get longer. People are going to think something's wrong. Exactly with what you're saying. If, you, if you're presenting all the tests and it's clear, much, much easier for somebody to buy, especially land. Like there's nothing hidden. You know, they're not that, doing a home inspection. You know, it's just like, it's like hey, I don't want to know. And then I don't have to disclose it. That's not, that's not a like sustainable long-term approach, right? Like, so yeah, it's, that, it, it, it's, a, it's a, a hoping for the best. And like, that's not the best. That's not the way to get the most money is not hoping for the best. Like it just the, does not work like helps that. Us on the acquisition side, meaning if we do find out there's wetlands or we do find out there's some buildability issues or something, it may be a sunk cost to us. We may lose that, but we're not going to make a bad acquisition. Right. So some of these problems that we solve ahead of time, not only do the, the, the buyer and the agent appreciate it, right? And, yeah. and it reduces the sell time. And the reality is like, it, it's part of our acquisitions criteria process. And it prevents us from, from getting excited about a beautiful waterfront lot or something yeah. and just buying the thing, right? Right. So Man, it's just worth its weight in gold, those extra steps. But it, what it does for us too is a lot of land, if, if people, you know, are interested or hear about land and land flipping, you look it up. Um, the majority of the industry is kind of geared towards very low value, cheap parcels. And there's yeah. a lot of, you know, $97 courses. And, and the idea is that a lot of it is marketing and it's just trying to, of course, to, to, you know, allow anybody to get into it. And like I said, when I started, we did these $500 auction properties. Yeah. That's available to everybody. And it's, it might be a good place to start if that's where you're at budget wise, Yeah, but it's not where you want to spend your career. Right. So what we learned early on was if we're flipping these commodities (laughs) that everybody else has, right. We go on Zillow ahead of time and we go, Oh my goodness, there's 40 of these tax delinquent lots available in the subdivision. It's a commodity. Right. So what we've learned is these properties like this, where we've, we've kind of learned to specialize Jonathan, where we'll target vacant waterfront lots, you know, an entire County, like we'll build a manual list of every waterfront lot along a lake, along a river, or, you know, we'll pull targeted lists of, Hey, who within this County owns two, three or more vacant land oh, properties. That's my so, favorite. It's yeah, very, so that's with, awesome. With yeah. one stamp, with one cold call, with one text, whatever your your outreach method is, we have the potential for these outsized returns because we're going after higher value leads. Yeah. Okay? And I love the I love the multiple property owner with multiple properties. And then I love to rank them by how far away they live from the properties. Yeah. yeah. So if I build the list, I'm like three thousand miles away that one I'm going to keep calling like every day because they're the highest likelihood to sell. What do they need vacant land in Indiana when they live in California? We we go through something that I'll share that we do is like that where you kind of, let's say you were lead scoring, right? Or you're saying, hey, yeah. I didn't want to mail everybody on this list because of exactly. the cost. Yeah. You would say, uh, well, first we would look at like length of ownership and then yep. we would look at out of state, obviously owners. Yep. The, the beauty with land, and with houses that sounds obvious, but with the beauty of land is, you're not talking somebody out of their home they're currently in. Like all, yeah. all the and land they're not getting target, rent for it. All of the land we target is, you know, it's not owner occupied. It's yeah. vacant. So there's just immediately every single parcel we're reviewing. There's not that emotional attachment because somebody hasn't measured their kids and marked the door jam. They're not living right. in a house right. and wondering where they have to go next. And and they're they're getting no income from it. So there's really yeah. no purpose for it unless they have a plan. And that's like the dialogue on the phone. It's pretty yeah. simple. Are you planning on doing anything with this? No, I bought it a long time ago. Great. I'll buy it. Sure. That's why people will sell land for $500 because it's 500 more than they had yesterday and they don't want to get an agent and figure anything out. Like, uh, I, I love so that's it. the I low hanging it. fruit jonathan is like if somebody said all right like what is the lowest thing? i would say like you immediately go out of state and then you go <laughs> length of ownership if they own yeah. 10 15 years or more and live out of state we're kind of like list stacking now right yeah yeah, and yeah. yeah so so some of those things would allow you it would increase the probability of an acceptance rate if you go after those but we also like to target specific property types like subdividable 
larger acreage property, the waterfront I mentioned, people that own two, three or more. These are strategies that kind of allow us instead of just flip, 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 going after single parcels and yeah. cheap parcels, they allow us to potentially capture, you know, six figures um, do, to do less transactions per year, but but more margin, more profit per transaction. Yeah, better bang for your buck. Hey, it's Jonathan, just taking a brief break from this episode to talk to you about Royal Legal Solutions. I had Scott Royal Smith on episode 92 of the podcast. You can go back and check that one out after you finish this episode. And he opened my eyes to how much protection I was losing every year that I didn't activate, build a team, and protect my assets. You can get information about Royal Legal Solutions by using my link at bit.ly slash zen royal. And bit.ly is bit dot l-y slash zen royal. You'll find a lot there. You'll find a 30-minute video to watch with Scott. And I can guarantee you what you hear on the podcast is exactly what you're going to hear in that video. So give it a try. I'm down the rabbit hole right with you. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, this is great info. So I mean, if there's a, a listener out there, which I'm sure there's plenty right now, we're thinking like, actually, this might be for me. Where is a place where people could go to like buy their first piece of land now without, you know, going into the whole thing, just like how you guys started? Like, where's the best place now to go without, you know, their own marketing? Yeah, I, I think because you're right, it is like you are the way we teach it. You are building a business. We teach you how to build a business, yeah. right? So I think it's like just fast getting in, doing a deal, like bid the number four assets.com. Yeah. And then you, then you choose county tax auction sales. And then you look at land would be like, would probably be the easiest way to get into this. You'll, you'll also find if you go to land.com and you, you search your county, and then you yeah. just sort low to high price. The funny thing is if it, there's actually opportunity, Jonathan, like for arbitrage, even with between platforms, like if you pull up Zillow or Realtor split screen yeah. with like a land.com, right? Or a landwatch.com. Yeah. What you'll see is actually you have all these land flippers on one platform <laughs> and you've got all these realtors and agents selling yeah. for full market value on the other. You actually see opportunity. You go, boy, I could buy for 10,000 over here and sell for 15 or 20 over here. Yeah. So that's the reality is if you're just going after smaller stuff, there's even potential on market like that or arbitrage between platforms. Yeah. But I think the auction, I feel like online auction sites, because you don't have to show up in person, yeah. are the, the easiest way to do a deal. The way we teach it when you're starting, like, I generally teach people more like, hey, how do you build a six figure second income? Yeah. And whether that's like to leave your job, or it's just like as a safety net or a second income stream. You know, cause I have a number of kind of like white coat or professional type people who go, Hey, like, I'm not, it's not like I'm miserable at a call center, you know, like, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm a, I'm a dentist, right? Like I own a yeah. practice, yeah. but they want to do real estate and they want to yeah. build wealth on the side or, or add land to their portfolio. In yeah. fact, some just want to buy, they don't even want to resell. They just want to capture equity and add land, right? Yeah. To their portfolio. Well, I mean. I really like land as an asset. I've owned a decent amount over the years. I, I just think of it as like a, well, it could be something. And like you said, it's a, it's a low risk. Like a, I'm willing yeah. to lose it, but I still have the land. So how much am I going to lose if I buy something for like a thousand dollars? My dad was a classic. He, you know, he would just like, he's like, oh yeah, we have a piece of land there. And then like that one, I'm like, what's that one? That's disgusting. He's like, yeah, there's a cell phone tower. We make 7,000 bucks a month. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like he just like he, anything that looked like it had a possibility, he would just buy. Cause like you said, the, those land options, like it's just not expensive. So what if the, what if something happens and like you buy a piece of land and then there's a big development going and you just got yourself a windfall. And for us, I think the key to drive home is it doesn't matter like what asset class you're in. Any any asset class or, or any business model where you're buying an asset for 50%, you're capturing 50% or more equity upon purchase, right? Yeah. You yeah, immediately yeah. kind of insulate yourself from, from risk. 
you know, and stack the odds in your favor. So that's what I'd say. Whether I mean, whether you're trading watches or cars or something, people yeah. drove it off the lot and you're buying used ones. For us, we feel like just with land, having done houses and remodels and flip, like the we typically buy, you know, at about the nicer stuff at about fifty percent of market value. Yeah. Right? Anywhere from thirty to fifty percent of market value. Like we'll buy rural vacant land for thirty to 35 percent of market value yeah we might buy a really nice really nice infill lot in tampa or something for like 60 percent of market value right yeah but we're still we're capturing so much equity we're positioning ourselves kind of to protect against any sort of correction so i would say no matter what asset class you're in whether you're buying cars or airplanes or watches yeah. or yeah. land if you're buying things for 50 cents on the dollar you're you're not reliant upon that sweat equity or or, or adding value to it. So yeah. that's truly for us. That's that's where there's a lot of grace with that model, I guess. Right? We can make some mistakes and still get out okay if we're capturing enough equity on the front end. Yeah, I mean it's really the ultimate hold investment. You don't need to do any maintenance unless you're like on a residential block that requires like mowing. But like. A a lot of this, you could just buy and let it sit there for five years and see how much money you've made with very little, you know, output. But, you know, getting to, to flipping, this seems like one of the, I wouldn't say nothing's easy in flipping anything, you know, any type of asset, but like, there's just men, very few things that can corrupt it, because it starts as something so basic as just literally a big pile of grass or dirt, you know, and then you add on these like amenities, like you said, which is extra testing, ready to build, you know, tests, and that helps somebody make a decision easier. But these can trade pretty, pretty quickly if you know what you're doing, right? Yeah. And, and you can, the thing is like with, with subdividing, for example, if you buy one large acreage property, like we, we partnered with a, a client on a 14 acre property and we subdivide it into five smaller parcels. Okay. Yeah. There's an example where if you chose to, so that's one deal, you know, you had to send some letters, you had to talk to a lot of leads, right? You might have had to talk to 30 or 40 people to get that one deal, right? Just, yeah. being, just being very transparent and realistic with people like you might only get a 1% response rate from your direct yeah. campaign. Yeah, yeah. And then you might talk to 30 or four people to get that one deal. But then yeah. like that one deal, we subdivide it into five one, they call it a parent parcel into five children parcels. Well, then if we turn around, Jonathan, like this, we could sell those cash or we could sell them on payments, right? Yeah. Which in this market with a high interest rate, we're, you know, it's yeah. terrible to be a borrower or a buyer right now, but like Great as far to be as the being bank. a lender, yeah. <laughs> we're originating some juicy notes at 10 yeah. to 12% interest right now. So when you, that's kind of our, like our, I called the triple play, right? Where we capture yeah. equity. We force appreciation with a subdivide, and then we have interest income from selling it on payments. You know, yeah. it, 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 the I mean, math it's a pretty out easy foreclosure well. for a lot of the reasons we said. If they don't pay, there's no tenants. So, like, whatever. <laughs> right. Yep. And we use like a note servicing company. So like they, they handle you have that the automatic, you're right. It's not, you're not pulling somebody out of their house. It, it's not a owner occupied land, right? It, it's vacant yeah. land. So. It's interesting because a lot of people pivot to self-storage as a more passive investment because there's no tenants inside and there's no bathrooms, but they're discounting land, which has no structure. And what right. I think is interesting about real estate as a whole is if you look at all real estate houses, what people consider real estate is mostly houses, they're all on land. <laughs> you know, so I, say, most of, go ahead. I say that all the time is like, you know, and it's not like a mine versus yours, but I say your asset sits on mine, like end of, end of exactly. discussion, right? like your asset sits on my asset. I don't care if you're commercial, what you are, but like, for example, storage shed, like maybe you want to build a storage shed. Well, what if you bought the land you're going to build that on for half price? Like that'd yeah. be a great, a great spot to start. Right. So there are some advantages where like, I don't try to play the marketing game of pitching my asset versus another one. I actually think they, they play well with each other. Exactly. You can build a, a high cash, a land flipping business that spits off a lot of cash. And then you could put that into these, these more like generational wealth or longer term, assets that have better tax advantages and yeah. depreciation and stuff like, like, you know, a multifamily, for example. Right. So, or storage storage is yeah. incredible itself. Yeah. 
So it's not either or sometimes like even us, like for our personal investment strategy, it's not all land, right? We take money from that yeah. and put it in others and, and sticks, right? Sticks and bricks. Yeah. So it's not just positioning as, as land is better than this. Just for us, we found that as far as like actual profit and spitting off cash, land has been the best, you know, asset class. And that allows us later, rather than using like after-tax dollars or W-2 income into like houses, single family or multifamily, if we run our land business, we can take that money, reinvest it, but we can also put it over here if we want to. So there's a lot of guys that are like, if somebody's running like a burr business, this is perfect because you're probably leaving some money in every month yeah. with that reef. If you're even doing a refinance right now, but you're leaving <laughs> money in because you can't pull 100% out, right? Right. You know what I mean? You can't pull 100% out. It's yeah. probably 75, maybe 80. So you're leaving some in. So like having like a, a land flipping company in parallel would prevent you from having to dip into your personal funds. So yeah, I'm a big fan of if somebody's an advanced investor uh, of kind of, you know, overlaying or doing both together. Yeah. But if you're if you're a beginner, it's a, a great asset class to start with because there's you're not dealing with with inspections and, and all, everything that goes on with you don't need a degree in construction right yeah. to understand the asset class of, of dirt it's just crazy to me though how so many people are going into wholesaling as a new investor thinking like that's the cure to turn the money where there's uh, you don't know repair costs and you don't know arv so how are you being a wholesaler in the beginning when you can literally just you know if you buy something for 500 and you can even if you sell it for a thousand it's a win you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's way less due diligence that you need to do, you know, to even wholesale land. Like you're not responsible for as much as a house where you could get everything wrong. Right. Yep. And we, what we do also, because obviously every lead doesn't turn into a deal, you know, we work with, because we're at a price point reselling where we rely upon agents to resell the properties. We're getting opinion of values and we're working with agents. So there's a lot of properties that, that the seller might want full market value or we can't come to an agreement. So it's rather than just like discarding those as dead leads, there's a lot of opportunity for us to say, Hey, well, we couldn't come to an agreement, but I know yeah. a great agent. You're right. obviously motivated to sell. Like, would you like me to introduce you to a great agent? Yeah. So it becomes a situation where we can kind of spoon feed a lot of our agents, these listings, right? Yeah. And in return, they're willing to provide us opinion of values upon request as we're reviewing potential deals. So it, it's more of like a business where you're building a relationship, right? With these agents, with title companies, with surveyors. Yeah. 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 So it's not just, just, you know, yeah, getting things under contract and assigning it, right? Like our approach we prefer is like to, to build it as a business and to look at like other people as assets and team. Yeah. And grow that network instead of just being that oil change technician, right? The, the wholesale, like you're just doing the same. You don't have 20 years of experience. You have one year of experience repeated 20 yeah, years, 20, right? Yeah, exactly. What can happen with wholesaling? Yeah. No, these are great points. So tell us a little bit about your coaching and educational program that you guys do, because I think it's important. You've obviously shown that you know the stuff. And I always say podcasts are a great way to know if people actually really know stuff, because there are so many shiny objects out there. You can't hide on a podcast like you know what you know. So now it's a great time to say, like, what do you do for people who are interested to getting into land investing? And, and what's the scale for them in terms of like, you know, getting in and what they can learn from you guys? Yeah, well, I started with just being an advanced and as, as after I, I felt like I became kind of an intermediate or, or maybe yeah. even flirting with advanced investor, all these forums and groups I was in, I would see beginners post these questions, you know, and I would say, hey, I, I remember having that question. I remember struggling <laughs> with that. And I knew that like they might spend months or weeks wondering and Googling and watching YouTube videos. Well, and yeah, I because knew, like, there, there's not as many people there to answer the land questions. I mean, the L, sure, should I start an LLC? Everyone's asked that <laughs> yeah, a million every, times. Yeah. But you don't have 50 people who can come in and answer like, hey, what do I do with this plot in the middle of, you know, Alaska? If there's no affiliate attached to it or no link you can send or, or it's like you say, it's something like that, then not everybody's jumping in to answer. Yeah, so right. there's a lot of opportunity for me to answer these questions. So as I would help people with that are starting their businesses and I would kind of help them with choosing markets and pulling lists, people would get deals under contract. And yeah. then they would kind of circle back and, and say, hey, I got this one under contract. This is a great deal. 
it's a, a buy for 50, it's worth 110 or something, for example. Yeah. And then you you say, Hey, good job. You know, kudos to you. And then they'd be like, well, I don't have the 50, you know? And then, so <laughs> it, it kind of organically, like just answering questions on forums led to some JV opportunity much before kind of like coaching or consulting. Right. So, yeah. so like we started, um, as I started helping people, I started JVing with these individuals and then the, then as it worked, I guess you'd say others would kind of refer their friends. And then it, then it yeah. kind of became a point where I was spending two, three hours a day, having my brain picked on the phone. And, and we recognized like that we needed to kind of create actual entities, right. For this. So we, we created a education entity, education and training company, and then co-founded a capital company, which after we've essentially trained somebody up on how to, to do this and how to get deals under contract, if they don't have their own access to capital or, or yeah. either maybe first deal, especially they don't, they don't want, maybe they haven't, don't want to risk it. They want to yeah. partner. And then we've got a capital company that we can JV with them on the deal. And that's kind of how it, like the journey of, you know, it started with just answering and helping people on forums. Yeah. And then it was interesting because we didn't like release a course first. Like I just started helping people and then we were JVing. Yeah. And then it, it became where the one-on-one like consulting was, was becoming like more demand than supply. I couldn't keep up. So I started doing these group yeah. coaching trainings before, you know, pre COVID, right. These group coaching before they were kind of a thing. And then that allowed me with feedback people would give me that allowed me to kind of like build a course syllabus, like based on all that feedback, I'd say, Hey, they'd say, Hey, too long winded here or not enough over here. Yeah. And yeah. then it, it allowed us to kind of build the course with all this great feedback. Yeah. And then we, yeah, then we launched like our, our kind of basic land flipping mastery course, which is kind of like getting brilliant at the basics. Yeah. And then we also do group coaching and, and run a mastermind or we, some of those things you and I talked about subdividing yeah. and targeting waterfront. We teach those in the mastermind. Yeah. But yeah, if you go to travisking.com, we have everything from like a, a, a free seven day land flipping challenge, which just allows you to like get oriented with the asset class of land without yeah. getting out your credit card and buying a course or anything like right, you right. can kind of learn about rural vacant land versus residential lots. You kind of get familiar with that. And then we have um, the mastermind. We have one-on-one -on -one coaching. We kind of think people at every level, because we it's, it's our journey. You know, we've been at every yeah, level. Yeah, for right? sure. So there's really something for, for everybody in there. But you could pop over to TravisKing.com and you'll find find a number of training programs. Yeah, the JV thing, I think, is a good point, too, because, like, it's also a very safe JV. You know, like, when you JV and you're doing a flip, like, you're always going to get in a fight and not be friends afterwards. If you're JVing just, like, a hybrid piece of dirt, like, you're pretty safe. Like, you're just going to yeah. trade it, you know? Yeah, yep. The And for us, the the thing is, too, you're, so you're getting, like, we have a, a partner in that business. And my wife and I work all, all three businesses together, our yeah. land company, our education company, and then our capital company, right? But you're getting three sets of eyes for us, like on a JV deal, right? Yeah. So like we're yeah, all yeah. looking at the property. And I think that's for us, it's, it shows that we've, we've got a vested interest. It's, we're not just hawking training courses, right? Like the, the idea is that we want to train you up so that we can do some deals together. Maybe we can do some subdivides. Maybe we you can JV with you yeah. because for everybody that that's really like the end goal is those, those bigger numbers. Yeah. And last thing before we hop off, I think, you know, you're, you're saying something important about like, you know, what's real and what's not, because when you were going on your journey to figure out what you like, you you found some shiny objects that didn't turn out to be the best, right? Yeah. Oh, well, absolutely. So early on, everything from flipping cars, campers, quads, you know, <laughs> yeah. houses, um, Amazon affiliate, mystery oh, shop, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, low, low point. I mean, so the... the the thing is the, like the ambition was there, right? But yeah. the focus wasn't. And in well, hindsight. Well, the, it's passion too, though. Cause like you yeah. didn't find the thing that matched that like really filled you up until you see this. And then you're like, wow, this, I like this. And that's, that's really why I'm so happy like to evangelize it. Right. It allowed me one to become a full-time investor and, yeah. and then later even grow it from there and, and launch additional companies. Right. And kind of like be a true business owner. So, yeah. to, so I, you know, I have a lot of uh, gratitude for the asset class, but I, I would say like, I think that the main thing is focus. You know, I think a lot of people, no matter what you're in, 
if you committed to that for a year and that's all you did, chances are any one of those things I probably could have been successful at. Yeah. The challenge was, you know, you jump from one to the next. Right. You know, and for us, we really, we really committed and, and stuck with, stuck with land. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and I'm thankful. So I'm, I'm happy to, to share that. There's just, obviously there's so much land right out there. There's so much yeah. opportunity. It's not as, it's not as mainstream, you know, as, as, um, the other asset classes. Yeah. Awesome. And so we got your website, which is travisking.com. That's where all of the content is and the land course and coaching and social, which you do a lot of as well, which I think is great. That's going to be underscore Travis A. King. That's on Instagram and TikTok, right? Correct. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, that was great information. I really appreciate it. As I told you before, I think this is like our 3.5 land show. We've had two yeah. others and then we kind of had a half in the middle. But I think it's a great asset class that people, anybody can have access to. But if you learn how to do it, you're also like putting in a lot of smarts into something that can scale pretty quickly if you do it the right way, just from your story from going five, sell it for 2,000, five, sell it for 5,000 wait, the snowball's already big, like right away. Yeah, yeah, it, it can be, a, if you're doing small deals, it can be kind of a wash, rinse, repeat yeah, deal. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's the neat thing is it's it's an inefficient market at every level, whether it's a yeah, $3,000 yeah. lot or a $3 million ranch, you know, like the, yeah. if you're targeting off market, there's there's opportunity um, there. You know, you, you just got to find what, what fits you and your goals. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate you. Yeah. All right. That was Travis King. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next week. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green. And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part. I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor. Like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends, and be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening.